Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Um, my name is Suvendrini. I will be your moderator today. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ambassador Extraordinary, Dr. Shaida Mohammed Abdali. He will uh, talk about the situation in Afghanistan today the, uh, and the future and the role of Japan in bringing progress, development, and normalcy in Afghanistan. <clears throat> Dr. Shaida Mohammed Abdali has been an um, assistant to former President Karzai, and his specialty is in security. He has been the ambassador in Japan for the past two and a half years, if I'm correct. And he has, um, he has um, great experience in, of course, Afghanistan. He will talk to us about um, his thoughts on how Japan can lead Afghanistan and bring a new Afghanistan and normalcy in, in global politics. Thank you very much. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Well, a very good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your <coughs> kind introduction. Uh, I was told earlier to introduce briefly, in a different way, that uh, what is my current status in, in uh, Japan. So I'll do so as as instructed yes, by yes, please, yes, by uh, Ms. Suvindrini. The government that appointed me as the ambassador of Afghanistan, as you all know, uh, no longer exists. So I do not represent the current government in Afghanistan. Um, I still continue to. Uh, be in my diplomatic position appointed by the previous government with the same status as before the fall of the government. Uh, with full diplomatic credentials in Tokyo. So my current role is to advocate for the interest of the Afghan people. And of course, our foremost objective is to uphold our legitimacy as the representatives of the Afghan people in Japan, along with my other embassy colleagues. We are meeting here today in a very important month, the month of August. The month of August is a reflection of peace in Japan which is marked by the anniversary of the end of World War II. And in this month, we've had a number of events, such as the peace memorial ceremonies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it's indeed noteworthy also that 15th of August, is Japan's own end of war adversary. On this date, Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. So this convergence of historical dates emphasizes the importance of our discussion today. So it's, before I move on to explain what is the current situation in Afghanistan, let me start with the important role Japan played for Afghanistan over the last over 20 years. And to reflect how Japan can continue to support Afghanistan. Since 2001, Japan, as you all know, helped Afghanistan with over 6.6 .6 billion US dollars, being the second largest donor after the United States in Afghanistan. 
laying the foundation of Afghanistan reconstruction in 2002. So Japan's contribution has helped build critical infrastructure in Afghanistan in the last 20 years, addressing humanitarian needs, improve education, healthcare, and promote economic development in Afghanistan. For that, the Afghan people hold a deep sense of gratitude to the people of Afghan, to the people of Japan, as true friends of the people of Afghanistan. And this relationship was not a relationship between governments. This was more a relationship between peoples. And we have great memories of great people from Japan who helped the people of Afghanistan all along. Dr. Nakamura, as you all know, in particular is remembered for his leadership in medical and irrigation until he sacrificed his life for the well-being of the Afghan people. He is a symbol of how we define this people-to-people -people relationship between Afghanistan and Japan. And of course, Madam Mugata, who led JICA in terms of the economic and developmental projects in Afghanistan for years. So all of this in the last 20 years brought a huge change in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, the fall of Kabul on August 15 undoubtedly was a significant setback to what we were doing, led by a country, as I mentioned, Japan, over the last over 20 years. However, it's important to emphasize that the support provided during the last 20 years has not been in vain. The Afghan people were empowered, receiving a sense of freedom and hope, learning about democracy and the rights, and the ideals of liberty and peace. So the seeds of democracy, freedom, liberty, have been sown in the hearts and minds of the Afghan people. And they continue to endure in the hearts and minds of the Afghan people today. So this spirit persists even under the current challenging times in Afghanistan. As Afghan ambassador to Japan and someone who has been involved deeply in the pursuit of peace in Afghanistan. For many years, I would like to put forward a few proposals at this juncture today. I strongly condemn the pr practice of governance through violence, through force, and I'm dedicated to the pursuit of inclusivity in government and respect for all. And I firmly believe that we must establish a robust platform for discussion that unites a new generation of Afghans. All sharing of all varying or sharing the same vision of violence free and peaceful Afghanistan. And for that, I'm, I've been seeking international support to help Afghanistan move forward, particularly and emphatically request Japan assistance, recognizing its potential to play a significant role in aiding Afghanistan. The current situation, as you all know, I don't want to dwell on in details what's going on. I think you have been reading in the press. But since the Taliban took over. In Afghanistan, the policy they have enforced 
have led to a continuous and alarming erosion of various human rights violations. The right to education, particularly for girls, the right to work for women, and so on. So the Taliban are, doing, are, are undoing progress made over the last 20 years. Their promise of more inclusive government have not been fulfilled. And of course, you must have also heard about the UN report recently on human rights violations. Despite the declaration of general amnesty, we have had detention, disappearances, and mistreatment. As of now, Afghanistan is facing an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Over 90% of the population is living in poverty, struggling with food insecurity, malnutrition, displacement, and lack access to basic services. And the current economic challenges have led to a dire humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. Internal, prob internal power struggle with the within the Taliban. You must be hearing about some moderate voices and some extreme voices. Resistance of anti-Taliban groups, Daesh with certain attacks here and there, is what we're facing today. So what we need to do and what is the way forward? And that is to start with building consensus among the international community, promoting political engagement. And we know all countries not prioritize human rights and political inclusivity equally. But without a more inclusive political approach, long-term stability is unsustainable in Afghanistan. As you all know, we had the first Doha meeting led by the United Nations in May 2023. And that meeting decided to hold a follow-up meeting. We believe the most suitable venue to hold a follow-up UN meeting is Japan, given its great legacy of its 20 years long fine presence and support to the people of Afghanistan. A conference that could endorse the consensus among the international community and bring together key stakeholders, including representatives of all political factions including the Taliban, the Afghan diaspora, the civil society, to discuss a comprehensive political path towards a new era for Afghanistan. And we can turn that initiative, the Tokyo process for new Afghanistan. Japan has shown its willingness to host this follow-up meeting as some others have also shown their interest. But because of Japan's diplomatic standing globally and its neutral position, Japan is the most suitable country to host this follow-up crucial meeting of the United Nations for Afghanistan. So one process to hold to coordinate international consensus, international community, followed by, as a complementary to another very important process, is the intra-Afghan dialogue. So establishing a meaningful and inclusive dialogue between the 
the Taliban and a new generation of peacemaking Afghan experts is crucial to achieving lasting peace and stability in Afghanistan. I use the term peacemaking Afghan experts. In my mind, it refers to new leaders who possess the qualities needed in today's global society to build a new Afghanistan, rather than those military leaders in the 90s using force to govern societies. Some eff efforts of this kind have been already undertaken in various countries, but they need to be coordinated. For this, also, Japan is exceptionally well suited to assist Afghanistan endeavor to launch and oversee an inclusive intra-Afghan dialogue. Given its widespread trust, trust among all parties involved, I believe including the Taliban. This assistance may encompass technical support, capacity building, and financial contribution to guarantee that the dialogue process is all encompassing and reflects the diversity of Afghan society. At the same time, while we're engaging Afghanistan, it's very important to strike a balance between engaging with Afghanistan for humanitarian and security reasons. We're also addressing concerns about the actions and policies of the Taliban. We also hope that the world community, particularly Japan, will continue to aid Afghanistan under the current humanitarian, humanitarian crisis. And we are grateful to Japan over the last over two years to help Afghanistan with over 200 million US dollars in various areas. But of course, to ensure that the aid reaches those in need in Afghanistan. In conclusion, we would like to see Japan use its unique strengths to continue its great legacy of support for the people of Afghanistan once again. And let me compare this to pre-2001 era of a political process or roadmap for Afghanistan like the one we had in Bonn. Equally important, important role Japan can today play for a new era in Afghanistan. And I strongly believe that Japan has the credibility and mix of economic development and assistance resources to lead this international engagement on Afghanistan. In ways that all of the regional nations, even with their competing interest, they don't actually appreciate in Japan's role to play with regard to Afghanistan. Japan's involvement in coordinating international efforts and supporting intra-Afghan dialogue without any doubt can significantly contribute to the pursuit of sustainable and lasting peace in Afghanistan by leveraging its diplomatic strengths Japan can play a constructive role in facilitating discussions and building consensus among the diverse actors involved in Afghanistan's future. So this was my summary of remarks. And of course, we have a paper, the highlights of my remarks, and you can use it later for your own purpose. And we can also discuss further if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Floor is open for questions. Yes, please come up to the microphone. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Ambassador. My name is Nishimura with Hokkaido Shimbun. Um, you have a proposal that the, the international conference led by United Nations, and uh, it, it will be included uh, uh, Taliban to that uh, conference. And I think the Taliban seems to have a different uh, standard in terms of human rights or especially the uh, inclusive uh, women's rights or gender inclusive society. So how do you, how can you hope the, the Taliban is uh, cope with the international standard of the gender equality or uh, what is the benefit for Taliban to join that in, uh, international conference and what is the uh, Japan's role in terms of joining, uh, inclus including Taliban? Thank you very much. Well, we fully understand the current situation, but because we don't have a roadmap, a comprehensive approach, first among the international community, to create that pressure, the Taliban will have no way out but to accept the world community with one unified, a united voice. At the same time, the Taliban have never denied the need for inclusivity. And they, at the same time, term their own government as an acting government. And that's why I said we have to strike a balance between our engagement, you know, on our, in terms of our engagement in, in the context of humanitarian support and security and monitoring the policy and actions. So, the reason why the Taliban have stood the ground on what they're doing is because of the lack of that international consensus, unity, in the first place among the international community, this in the second place, unity about, um, among Afghan sides and groups. So we have to nurture that, and we have to use all our tools, the issue of recognition, the issue of sanctions, and etc. So we have to build that platform to convince or persuade the Taliban to adhere to the wishes of the world community and of the Afghan people. So we need to work for that to happen, which you don't have this point. Therefore, the coming conference on Afghanistan, led by the United Nations, hopefully hosted by Japan, will create that sense of urgency and create a momentum to encourage all stakeholders, the world community, including our region, and to create that pressure that the Taliban accept. And we have a system in Afghanistan based on a roadmap as I compared the one that we had over 20 years ago that led the foundation for a 20 years long effort in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, we lost. And we can create that kind of platform once again. Yes. OK. Right. Anybody else? Yes, Mara. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Mara Bhajan from the Japan Times. Um, you mentioned this lack of consensus amongst the international community. Why do you think there has been this lack of cons consensus up to this point? Like, I understand kind of your vision for the future, but why have we not been able to achieve that so far? Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, we, we understand the world and the current situation. A number of reasons. War fatigue, 20 years long effort in Afghanistan ending where it ended, and more importantly, the crisis in Ukraine. And we hope that Ukraine does not become what Afghanistan became, ultimately. We feel for that country. But at the same time, we hope that the world community will not forget about a country that they have all experienced what it can do 
to the security of the globe. We should not have that short memory of where Afghanistan is. We know what happened in Afghanistan, but it must not be blamed on, on a single or a few actors. It was a wholesome failure of the international community pursuing the goals that they established in 2001. Leaving immaturely or prematurely from Afghanistan with an unfinished business can hurt the world once again. And we hope the world community will return back to an unfinished mis mission in Afghanistan. Can I lead up with a question on that? I know we had a very good conversation before, but we have a lot of new players now in the international community, like China or UAE. Now, does this make it easier for the vision of Afghanistan, having these different players compared to 20 years ago? Well, there is no doubt of different players today as compared to the players we had uh, 20 years ago. But the result can be the same. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to deal with new players as it, it is required. We understand that Afghanistan, the failure in Afghanistan today is used as a propaganda. And this can easily become a security th threat later. So different players, yes. But the history can be repeated easily. So what should bother us is the result, not the players. Yeah. Yes, open to more questions. We still have a lot of time. Anybody, not even open not to, to everybody, not only journalists. Yes, please. I am Toru Takeda from GG Press, uh, and uh, I was former correspondent for South Asian countries and Afghanistan. So I covered uh, Afghanistan issues uh, for about five years. So uh, the 2021, uh, after Taliban's takeover, uh, I have touched a Taliban's uh, member. And uh, they said, uh, they said uh, we wrong. So we don't need to hear uh, the opinion uh, from foreign countries or UN. But so, uh, what will we do uh, to let the Taliban uh, to come to the discussion, uh, international discussion? Mm. Mm. Well, there is no doubt that the Taliban, some of them are saying this, and there are some pragmatist voices within the, within the Taliban who understand the ultimate fate of the status quo. The country cannot survive to be the lone example of the world in terms of governance, lack of constitution, and so on. Therefore, you may be hearing some voices, but they definitely need engagement and they want engagement. They want world recognition. They want to do business and trade. And that doesn't ha happen. So therefore, uh, I think there is a need for a trustworthy player to play that role. Uh, we unfortunately have been the victim of the conflict of interests whenever it came to a process of this nature. We have utilized various players to bring peace to Afghanistan. But unfortunately, it worked the other way around because of the conflict of interests there. And that's why we look for the right player this time. We, we have had enough of our region the immediate neighborhood, dealing with Afghanistan, uh, stability and security. They unfortunately became part of the problem rather than the solution. That's why today we look for a neutral player 
that is appreciated for its tradition of peace all over the world. The reason why I say Japan, even in the last 20 years, Japan never played a role of someone to fight. It always played a role of helping the people of Afghanistan through civilian ways and means. Never became a part of the war. Therefore, under the current circumstances, there is no one that you can think of other than Japan to even be okayed by the de facto authorities. So we need the right player, the right venue for a conference that will result into a roadmap accepted by the Taliban and the non-Taliban Afghans. And I think Japan is that country that we have been looking for to have a roadmap that will eventually bring peace and stability to Afghanistan. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, another question. Um, so this idea of Japan playing that role, to what extent is it shared by other players? For example, the UN, other Afghans maybe in a capacity similar to yours, whereby you are playing a role but from outside of the country. Um, you know, you mentioned this, I believe you used the word new generation of peace making Afghan experts, mm. uh, this kind of community, these kind of people, to what extent do they also see Japan, you know, playing that role? Or is this something that comes more from mm. you because you've been ambassador here for two and a half years? Thank you. Well, I can, I can with a lot of confidence, tell you that there is, an, there is an overwhelming support for Japan to play that role. I have been in touch with Afghans of all walks of life. And I've shared this idea, and this idea has been there for months. At least I've been pushing here in Japan. I can even tell you that, not through any direct communication with the de facto authorities, and I can see a soft corner for Japan from the de facto authorities in the context of Japan play a constructive role to bridge the gap between the international community and the gap between Afghans. So there is a need for that kind of uh, you know, role model. Mm. And Japan, for all the reasons of the last 20 years, with the legacy of being nothing but pushing, encouraging peace in Afghanistan. And there is no point to say that there is a party or actor to say no to what Japan uh, would be doing. So with full confidence, hope, overwhelming support for this from the old generation of Afghans, the new generation of Afghans, and I even can see a lot of support for this among the international community. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Um, my name is Yusuke Maikao. I'm from the um, Argus Media, which is the British um, Energy um, Intelligence Organization. Um, I'd like to ask you about, you just earlier mentioned about the, um, the Ukraine war um, caused the lack of you know, um, um, consensus over the Afghan situation. But how exactly, geopolitically speaking, geopolitically speaking, how has this Ukraine war changed the situation of Afghanistan? Is it, does it make um, did it make even harder, even difficult for the Western allies to get along with Afghanistan? I know we, from our own data um, information, I know that Afghanistan is now importing a lot from a lot of coal from Iran, um, importing crude oil from Russia. Do you, do you recognize that the, the Ukraine war situation has uh, brought the um, Afghanistan more closer to the Russian side, or? Or the, or, and shifting away from the Western side, how do you um, analyze um, the current um, Afghanistan situation in, term, in, in light of the Ukraine war? Thank you. Well, it's obvious uh, that 
countries define their priorities to deal with. Let me give you another example of what happened in Afghanistan early on uh, when the intervention took place after September 11. In 2003, Iraq happened, and the attention was diverted from Afghanistan a great deal to Iraq, and we suffered a lot because of that conflict, which was not that widespread at that time, and somehow Afghanistan maintained that importance for the world community, especially for the US. But this conflict today is much larger than that one. And therefore, the world look at this as a priority to deal with. So it has a direct impact on the attention that is needed for Afghanistan not to be there at this point. Everybody focuses on Ukraine because of, I mean, obviously, in a conflict that is fresh, and Afghanistan conflict has become old, perhaps not so important, but without any doubt that, that this neglect of Afghanistan can have an equal impact on the result of Ukraine war. Because you, you deal with the same players around Afghanistan that you deal with Ukraine today, in the context of Ukraine today. The same players, and you must be hearing some propagate the Western or NATO's defeat in Afghanistan in the context of Ukraine. They use this as a propaganda, and they glorify the victory because they want to use this as a tool against their opponents in Ukraine. So a direct imp relationship between Ukraine and Afghanistan today. But I can tell you for sure that, that uh, Afghanistan can and will become a source of uh, serious threat again. Uh, we all spoke about peace and no place anymore for terrorists to come and return back to Afghanistan. Within a month or so, you saw the leader of Al-Qaeda back in Kabul. And Daesh forces today active here and there. So if you don't focus on Afghanistan, focusing on Ukraine, we understand Ukraine, we feel for Ukraine. We don't say that you just leave Ukraine and come back to Afghanistan, no. But equally importantly, equally important is Afghanistan today, which will have negative impact on the outcome of Ukraine war if Afghanistan is neglected. Yes, please. Hello, Ambassador. My name is Kosuke from Kyodo News. Um, I actually have two questions. Uh, first is about the, the current status of the, the, the ambassador you or the embassy in Japan. So you still don't have any uh, formal or the official contact from the Taliban government, right? No, I don't, I don't communicate officially uh, with the government there, but definitely here I still... Um, keep my diplomatic status as officially accredited ambassador of Afghanistan to uh, Japan, and I'm grateful for, to the host country for appreciating that. Um, but as you know, uh, if you advocate for the interests of the Afghan people, you have to do what is needed to be done, and that is to continue to speak for Afghanistan, for the Afghan state, for the Afghan people, uh, seek help from Japan, as something that we do today. Uh, at the same time, uh, a good number of Afghan diaspora here. We deal with their council legal matters. Um, of course, if there are legal issues uh, for the Afghan diaspora here, you have to communicate to the concerned uh, institute, uh, institutions back in Afghanistan, and we do that, which does not mean recognition, which does not mean official correspondence. Uh, we issue visas to Japanese nationals going to Afghanistan. We issue visas to the Japanese diplomats, JICA officials. They go. So we have a reason to stay. Yeah, one more, yeah. 
Uh, thank you for your answer. And my another question is about uh, what you said, so-called new actors uh, who never existed 20 years ago. So I especially would like to ask about China. So I think China could, I'm not sure about their intention, but they might uh, play a key role uh, in terms of the st peace and stability of Afghanistan. So uh, as a diplomat, how do you see the Afghan diplomats approach or the diplomatic activity towards China to get them involved in the uh, peace and stability uh, conference or the building of consensus? Uh, how do you see uh, your effort or the result at this moment towards China? Well, as I, as I indicated earlier, we have been the victim, we have been the victim of conflict of interest, particularly from the region. And we really want our relationship to be normal and good, cordial, especially in, among us, the region, including our neighbors, China, Iran, Russia, and all. But at the same time, we also don't accept Afghanistan to be the victim of conflicts between regional and global actors. When I said international consensus, we would like to conclude everyone, including from the region, as part of the solution for Afghanistan in the context of the roadmap that I discussed. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, actors are different. Uh, you know, um, I must tell you frankly, that uh, the Taliban have support from some, not necessarily for the good of Afghanistan, but to fulfill their own national interests by pursuing what they have been pursuing in terms of their relationship and engagement. And therefore, there has to be unified, a meaningful voice from the international community while dealing with Afghanistan. We have to bring that consensus uh, as to how we deal with Afghanistan and what values that we have been speaking of. We're ensuring that that is the case and accept it in Afghanistan and respect in Afghanistan. Can I, yeah, just one from me. The, the, the roadmap that you sp speak about, what are the priorities? How do we go ahead? Well, the first priority is to bring together key stakeholders of the international community, building a consensus among all major players from P5 to the rest of the world, including our region. All speak of inclusivity now. All speak of women's rights and girls' education. But why don't we stream a line and make it in one particular platform and to make a unity, united voice vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban? Mm. That's why I said the upcoming conference, which will have over 20 countries' special envoys, as was the case in Doha. So those are the countries which include our region and the Western powers. So the, the priority is to start with international consensus building, a coordination between the international players, plus the region, of course. Once that international consensus and coordination is there, then you have you have at least a forum that can help in intra-Afghan dialogue or a conference that I referred to earlier, the one that we had before 2001, or in 2001, which brought all stakeholders, including the Afghan political factions, mm. under the one roof mm. to discuss a comprehensive roadmap for a new era in Afghanistan, which we had before. So now in that context, we are looking for a venue and a consensus building avenue, which is Japan that, I, that we are hoping to be the place. Nishimura. Okay. Um, 
You refer to the mission uh, unfinished. I think that mission uh, means the, not only the interna about the international conference, but about the effort of introducing Western type of democracy to the Af Afghanistan politics, society, and economics. And that, was, uh, that started uh, at the beginning of this century. I think uh, my question is, uh, how do you think that mission takes so long time? When I say mission unfinished was exactly what we hoped for beginning in 2001, how the world community wanted Afghanistan to look like. Of course, we had a democratic process, we had a nation building process, we had a reconstruction process. And at the same time, of course, more important to the West and to the world to deal with the question of terrorism. And I don't think we finished that mission as was expected and envisioned at that time. We lost our democracy. We lost our democratic institutions. And we have groups in Afghanistan that for now some say and portray it as peaceful situation, but is it sustainable? Is it lasting? No. So therefore, uh, on the way to achieve our goals in the last 20 years, we made a lot of mistakes. Why do we talk about lessons learned? Of course, Afghanistan uh, was never a dictatorship to impose foreign values or tradition or whatever. Along the way, some mistakes were made. Uh, and because of those mistakes, within, made, within Afghanistan, by Afghans and by the international partners, that ended up where we are today, where we lost a great number of achievements. But they still have not all gone in vain. We have a great number of Afghan educated leaders that grown up in the last 20 years. Millions of girls went to school and they are alive. Unfortunately, some of them are leaving. And today we can use that a future agent of change for Afghanistan. And that's why I said a new generation, peacemaking expert, Afghan experts. So that is the, that is the treasure that has been left to us because of the 20 years long effort in Afghanistan, and we have to build on that. So yes, we need democracy. Yes, we need freedom for expression, the ideas of liberty and peace, and a government that's represented by all Afghans. And we don't have that one out right now. So therefore, that mission that we wanted early on to succeed in the form of a government that would represent the Afghan people, that would speak for all Afghans that would have a government with all legal uh, you know, institutions, with a constitution, and we lost all of that. Therefore, that mission has to be revived. And lessons learned and mistakes made should not be repeated again. Any more questions? No. Yeah, Mara, yes. <laughs> and thank you for your interest. Thank yes. you. <laughs> what about the question of Afghan refugees in Japan? From what I understand, this year about 100 plus um, Afghans have been um, granted refugee status. I mean, do you see Japan also playing more of a role in this sense of, you know, being a country where Afghans who do face persecution or, or whatnot in, in Afghanistan can come and find a safe country in Japan and be recognized as refugees? Um, well, obviously, I mean, honest speaking, we are not happy uh, that our Afghans are leaving their country. They should stay rather. And we want the Afghans who have grown up, educated in the last 20 years, 
that they leave the country and be in the service of others uh, or in the other countries. Japan, of course, is not signatory to the uh, refugee convention also, and I don't think Japan accepts refugees. Those who were accepted here were employees of uh, Japan's uh, assistant agency, JICA, and perhaps the embassy, are about 100 of them. And we're very glad that Japan helped educate uh, hundreds of Afghans over the last 20 years. I believe over 600 Afghans were educated at master and PhD level in Japan. Some of them are here, some of them are in Afghanistan. So we want Japan to help Afghans within Afghanistan and give that scholarship that they've been given, give, that they were giving Afghanistan, and I'm glad that they renewed that commitment recently to give Afghans the opportunity to educate in Japan. Thank you. We have one online question from Khaldun Azahari, Pan Orient News. How do you evaluate the Arab and Muslim countries' relations and policies towards your country, especially Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and US, USA? You, you, US, USE, yes, USA, UAE, 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 maybe. UAE. Well, um, of course, each country has a role to play. Uh, I think uh, for Muslim countries to come up and speak for the religion rightfully from the region that we all represent or uh, that we belong to. Uh, unfortunately, much happened in the name of Islam and religion in Afghanistan, which did not and does not represent our religion, Islam. And that's where our Muslim brothers, countries like Saudi Arabia, the heart of Islam, can play a crucial role to really define what Islam is and not allow anyone to misuse Islam for political goals. Terrorism in Afghanistan for decades was ingrained in the name of Islam. But that never was Islam. Unfortunately, that tool is still being played, using religion as a tool for foreign policy, advancing interests, strategic interests in the name of religion. Therefore, we hope that Muslim countries that you mentioned step up and deal with the misuse of Islam as a political tool. For example, you hear ban of girl education of ones in the name of Islam. That is not Islam. Islam speaks and starts with Ekra, which is education for men and women equally. What religion is this banning girls from education in Afghanistan? That is not Islam. Our Prophet Muhammad wife was a trader. Why Afghan women are not allowed to work outside their homes? So these Muslim countries have an obligation to speak for religion, for Islam, and not allow anyone to speak and advance their vision, wrong vision of religion in the name of religion in Afghanistan. That is a very important role for Muslim countries to play. Organizations such as OIC, Islamic scholars, they must come up with a verdict against decrees in the name of Islam, banning girls from education, from universities, and so on. And I must still share with you a very heartening and very painful story recently where our hundred Afghan girls who had been banned from going to universities in Kabul had been kindly given scholarships in the UAE universities 
while they were at the airport to get on board and fly to Dubai to continue their education at the, at the university level, they were banned at the airport and they would return back to their homes. Now, where are those Muslim scholars to speak out? Why were those Muslim girls going to a Muslim country stopped at the airport and not allowed to go? And that's what the obligation is upon these important countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, the heart of Islam. Okay, no more questions. Okay, last one, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, what is your idea of the future new Afghanistan in terms of economy? It should not be dependent on opium. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, as you know, Afghanistan historically, traditionally, and geographically is the roundabout of the region. Unfortunately, this, the vision to connect Afghanistan never was realized, including the great re uh, vision of the new Silk Road, the idea of connecting South Asia with, South, with, with Central Asia. The South Korea, North South Corridor, and all that mm -hmm. is because of the continued instability and conflict in Afghanistan or around Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the engine and can be the engine of prosperity for the entire region. Afghanistan is situated in the middle of South Asia and Central Asia, which can address the needs of gas, energy, and connectivity for the entire region. For example, SARC, a South Asia organization that is equally important, defined equally as the EU in Europe, is be dysfunctional because of the lack of Afghanistan crucial role connecting South Asia with Central Asia. The famous TAPI gas pipeline from the 90s is left unrealized uh, or unrealized because of the lack of continued peace and stability and positive relationship within the region. So Afghanistan economy depends on the regional consensus and cooperation with Afghanistan for continued peace and stability, and then by, then by that realizing life-changing visions of those important projects and visions that I described earlier. So Afghanistan is historically the, the roundabout. The Silk Road went through Afghanistan. The region was glorious when Afghanistan was in good shape. And that lack of connectivity is because of the lack of continued peace and stability in Afghanistan. Oh, yes, just a short one, please. Um, you just mentioned about the natural resources there, but um, how do you think that the current government, do you think they have a willingness to open the development for the natural resources in Afghanistan for the foreigners? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> definitely, Afghanistan natural resources, thank you for raising this. We have natural resources of trillions of US dollars untapped in Afghanistan. Of course, currently some have gone, but the trust, the confidence to invest in such important natural resources requires continued stability and certainty and a sustainable system in Afghanistan so that foreign companies come and invest in Afghanistan. So definitely this is an area that will flourish and will give Afghanistan the self-reliance status. But that is preconditioned to what system we have in place in Afghanistan. If there's a peace, as I said earlier, yes, we're glad 
Hundreds of people don't die every day where it used to be. But can we be dependent on the situation for the long haul? No. It can change any minute. And that's why major companies do not go to Afghanistan, because they don't trust the continuity and sustainability in Afghanistan. Okay, thank you very much for coming, Dr. Ambassador Abdali. I thank you very much for a very honest, frank exchange with us. And thank you also for taking us above this very negative image of Afghanistan. We can see a future through your talk. And in, in honor and in respect for coming, I give you a one-year invitation to be a member. Thank you very office. much. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Honor to be a member. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And you can exchange name cards with the ambassador if you want.